Just when you thought you knew everything there was to know about .NET and portable class libraries, .NET Standard is coming along to ruin your day. Let's mash on that. Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of the ASP Net Monsters. In today's episode, I'm going to be confusingly stumbling around .NET Standard and trying to explain exactly what it is and why it is. So, let's uh, let's get into that. Uh, Tell us about this matrix. Yeah, so I, I always like to start with like the history of the world, um, which in this case is like back in the day, there was .NET and all was good and there was only one .NET and everybody was happy. Uh, and then Microsoft came out with a wide variety of other weird platforms and variants on the .NET framework. So I, I feel like the first one of those was Silverlight. I don't know if that's technically true. Um, but Silverlight was kind of... I think it might have been the Compact Framework, if you remember yeah, that one. It might have been... Okay, all right. So Silverlight or the Compact Framework or, or some other slight variant on, on .NET. And uh, one of the things that changes between these different versions of the framework is the surface area that is exposed by the base class library. So the base class library being all of the stuff in like system dot whatever, uh, all of that stuff in there is a base class library. And it is, it's a phenomenal achievement really from an engineering perspective in that unlike many other languages, and I'm looking at you on this one, JavaScript, uh, there's no need to pull in like a thousand third party libraries because there is this fabulous standard library that contains, I don't know, like 50%, 60%, 70% of what you need to do to get your job done. So if you're looking for, uh, an HTTP client, well, there's an HTTP client. If you're looking for a zip library, there's a zip library. If you're looking for something to do uh, Diffie Hellman key exchanges, there's stuff in there for that. Uh, Even so just the the broad set of collections that are built into the framework is huge. Like most right, yeah, most other so, libraries don't have that. Yeah, that's true. Still no tree structure, as far as I recall. Though. <laughs> true. Uh, so all of this stuff is built in, but for different platforms, we have different levels of exposure. So something like Silverlight uh, couldn't access the file system. So there's a bunch of file system related classes that are different under Silverlight or have gone away under Silverlight. And everything was okay for a while. And then the, the number of platforms kind of proliferated. And so we ended up with like Silverlight and Windows Phone and Windows Phone Silverlight. And uh, then there's a slightly different surface area for some of the Xamarin stuff. So as we continued along down this track, it ended up being pretty difficult to figure out kind of what to put in for various different versions of uh, .NET. So uh, this is a, a matrix here that gives an idea of kind of like some of the classes and where they're available. Uh, so the, the first idea that Microsoft had around solutioning this was the idea of a portable class library. So a portable class library is a library which is compiled to run on a variety of different platforms. So you might set it up so it would run on uh, like Silverlight and Windows 8 uh, or, or something like that, some combination. So when you created your project, you would go and kind of like down a checklist and be like, I wanted to run on this one, this one, this one, this one. And it would generate... Uh, an assembly which would run on that and it would target only the the API surface area which was available across all of those platforms. So it kind of took all the platforms that you'd listed, put them all together and found the, the largest possible intersect of all of those. I, I guess intersect by its definition is the largest possible intersect. But anyway, so it would find the intersect of all of these APIs and that would be what you could program against. So it would guarantee that you would be able to run all of those platforms because you weren't targeting anything that didn't exist on any of those platforms. Uh, so this gets a little bit confusing and you end up with odd package names uh, and odd assemblies. So you would do things like, hey, I want to target this and this and this. And then at the end of it, you would pop out with this library that said, okay, this is targeting profile 259. And that would target like four frameworks and you would get this unique number that would represent what it was that it was targeting. Uh, 
Uh, so kind of confusing and not super standard oriented. As soon as something else came out, some new platform came out and they've got to rebuild everything. Uh, and you have to build like a bunch of different versions of this stuff, depending on what it is you're trying to support. So if you look at something like JSON.NET, you go and explode the, the new get package for it, you'll find that it has a bunch of different things that it targets within there. So Microsoft came along and decided this was a bad plan. Uh, so they started on this effort to introduce .NET standard. So they, they went back to the drawing board and they took a look at what it is that's out there right now that runs on .NET. And they decided there were kind of like three big streams of frameworks that they had. So they had .NET framework. So this is kind of everything that you remember from the past. So this is what we would refer to now as probably like full framework. So this would be like 461, 462, those sorts of things. Uh, so that's everything. That's like the desktop or server side framework. Uh, there's .NET Core, which runs ASP.NET Core and also these universal Windows platform uh, packages all run under .NET Core. So .NET Core is a reduced in size version of the .NET framework and there's some things removed from it. Uh, so this entire class is removed and there's also some like entire API methodologies removed from it. Uh, so .NET Core was very focused on doing task-based async as opposed to uh, the old asynchronous framework which you'd have like begin and end methods. Uh, at the same time, there's also this third giant stream here, which was the Xamarin stream. And of course, Microsoft have brought Xamarin under the corporate umbrella now. So they have some ability to, to influence the way that Xamarin works. But all of this stuff is built on like these different base class libraries. So to get something portable between them, kind of difficult to do. So they started on this standardization effort here. Uh, to come up with the .NET standard library. Uh, so of course, as soon as you come up with a new standard, you know you've guaranteed to have just introduced like a whole new world of pain. There's a, there's a wonderful XKCD comic that I will link to <laughs> in the show notes related to this. Uh, but the idea is that this .NET standard library, instead of having uh, non-standard collections of APIs, so stuff that you would have to like pick and choose from different frameworks to build the intersect of it, they would go out and define this is the standard for this particular version of .NET standard. And anything that wants to implement .NET standard 1.4, let's say, has to implement this set of APIs. Uh, so they came up with a couple of different compatibility levels for .NET standards, so 1.1 all the way up to 1.6. Uh, and then basically said, these are the versions of .NET that work with it. Uh, so if you are running something like Windows Phone Silverlight, then you can only support .NET standard 1.0. So if you have additional functionality in a library that you need and it targets 1.2, well, you're out of luck if you're trying to target Windows Phone Silverlight. Uh, so the idea here is if you are a library vendor, then you would like to target your library at as low a possible version of .NET standard. Because as we move up these versions of .NET standard, kind of the surface area of the API increases at each step. So it, it's a little bit confusing because these are numbered like you would expect version numbers to be numbered, but it doesn't mean that these are like sequentially released. Like all of these were released at the same time here, but the, the surface area is what changes inside each one of them. So something like uh, .NET 452, well, it supports .NET Standard 1.2. So if you compile your library down to .NET Standard 1.2 and you don't address any of the new APIs in 1.3, then you can be guaranteed to run on 4.5.2 and 4.5.1. Uh, and so so forth up and on here, uh, getting to the higher version numbers and generally larger surface areas. So like .NET Core, for instance, uh, supports 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 so all of these here, all the way up to 1.6. Uh, 
So that means that it's capable of supporting like a 1.6 compiled .NET standard. So hopefully that makes some sense now. Uh, and everything is kind of reasonable at this point, except that now we're going to introduce uh, .NET standard 2.0. So .NET standard 2.0 is kind of the the odd one out here. So as we move up through like the 1.0 series here, the, the API surface area gets larger and larger, but then we get to version two and all of a sudden some of the stuff that was introduced in 1.6 disappears. Uh, and the reasoning for this is basically because uh, 4.6.2, .NET 4.6.2 doesn't have fantastic adoption yet. So the idea was that version two of .NET standard should basically implement the API that is the most available out there. Uh, and because 4.6.1, .NET full framework 4.6.1 is the most commonly installed, they decided to base everything off of that. Uh, so .NET standard 2.0 is gonna be limited to kind of that point in time with the API. There was not a huge amount that was introduced between kind of 4.6.1 and 4.6.2, although some really good stuff around uh, null pointer exceptions uh, coming down the line in that one. Uh, so by moving to this 2.0, they're hoping to do like a big standardization effort and kind of bring a bunch of platforms up to being .NET standard 2.0. So uh, the next version of .NET Core is going to support .NET standard 2.0. Uh, Xamarin iOS is going to support it, Xamarin Android, uh, the Universal Windows platform is going to support it. So it's going to give us kind of like a line in the sand that you can say, look, my library is going to support .NET Standard 2.0, and it should allow for some great compatibility across kind of the installed base of, of applications that are out there. Uh, I noticed that Windows Phone is not on the list here to move up to... 2.0 so that's windows phone 8 uh windows phone 10 would be under that yeah, right windows, windows platform windows. okay that makes a lot of sense i was going to yeah. read into that more than i probably should um so uh moving to this .NET standard in the the 1.x world has kind of cut you off a little bit from some of the full framework stuff uh, and made it difficult to use it uh so there is like some portability shims that get you back to the standard, standard library and the portable class library and that stuff is going to get um, a little bit better in the 2.x series so i'm hopeful that this will, will work out nicely in the, the long and short run i think it's going to be a little bit confusing in the next six to eight months for people who are looking to to build libraries but if you are not looking to build libraries if you're just consuming libraries for the most part, you don't have to worry about this. Um, you just need to be maybe a little bit concerned about the libraries that you do have and what version of .NET they target right now. So if you happen to be building something right now and it targets some libraries that only work on 4.6.2, uh, that might be something that you want to look at talking to the library vendor about maybe moving back to 4.6.1 uh, so that they can have full .NET standard 2.0 support. Uh, so I will I will link some stuff in the notes for this one in the hopes that people will be able to understand it better than me. So if you have any questions, put them down below and I will try and answer them. Uh, and chances are somebody from Microsoft will see this and correct us and maybe they'll come on the show and tell us how wrong we were. <laughs> so. Uh, well, that's great. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, no problem. I think it's everything that I wanted to cover. All right. Well, thanks. So we'll see everybody on the next episode of the ASP Net Monsters. Uh, remember to like, share, comment, and email us if you have any additional questions. We'll see everybody next time. Bye.